Madison himself, I should note, was not a Presbyterian, and yet he went to study at uh, Princeton. And why is a very complicated puzzle that many people have written about, and I personally have not found a good solution to. Although it would be fun to find a solution someday. Now, what is it that Madison encountered in Hume? Well, several very important things. One was the idea that factions, which most people in the 18th century, including both Hume and Madison, thought were not good things. Faction was an insulting word to them. The factions could be formed by various political reasons, but one of the most common forms of faction was faction based on religious belief. And in this, Madison was uh, looking, as Hume had done in de developing this view, to the wars of religion of the 17th century. So just a century before, Europe had dissolved into horrifying wars of religion, which were mostly, mostly Catholic Protestant, but occasionally were even Protestant Protestant. And anyone who was a Scottish Presbyterian knew especially well of the tensions that had taken place between Scottish Presbyterians and English Puritans and Congregationalists. Very intense, uh, uh, intense fighting at various moments in, in history. So faction was a bad thing. And faction could often be religious faction. Hume had the idea that under some circumstances, factions could counterbalance each other and that that balance might actually sometimes not be such a terrible thing. And he wrote about this idea extensively in his uh, History of England, as well as in his political essays. Madison knew these works well, and we have him taking notes on these works already when he was a uh, college student, and then thereafter at regular bases. And when Madison sat down to think up the Constitution of the United States, he thought about what Hume had had to say on these questions, and he extended it. He extended it to say that factions based on religion could counterbalance each other sometimes when there were enough of them, the point that he was making to the ratifying convention. And then, famously and fascinatingly, he took this insight about religious factions and he expanded it to all factions. And he came up with the idea that, again, it um, built on Hume, but it wasn't wholly encompassed in Hume, that if you had enough different sects with enough, sorry, enough different factions with enough divergent views in your republic, it was actually better than having a smaller republic with just a handful of factions where one might get a chance to dominate the other. And the reason this mattered so much is that up until Madison's time, it was frequently said by writers on politics that a republic, unlike a monarchy or an empire, could only work in a city-state, could only work in a small place but could not work across a very vast federation, which had to be organized imperially. Since Madison was in the process of designing for the Constitutional Convention, the first federal republic in human history, and just to note how important that is, it's not just important because the United States is today a federal republic. If you think of the European Union, precisely what it aspires to be is a federal republic. All over the world, you have people aspiring to the idea of becoming federal republics. It's an incredibly powerful idea. And Madison had to explain why that was possible when all writers on Republic for the previous roughly 2,000 years had all said that it was impossible. And his answer, building on Hume and on his views about religious faction, was precisely the same answer he gives in the ratifying convention about religion. Namely, that if you have enough factions, they will counterbalance each other, and the bigger your Republic, the greater the likelihood that you have a variety of factions and that they will, count, they will counterbalance each other. In reaching this position, Madison was influenced not only by Hume, but also by his real-world experiences in Virginia. And I just want to mention them to you before I turn to the contemporary issues that I said I would talk about. What happened when Patrick Henry proposed this model of non-preferential religious establishment in Virginia and Madison fought against it? Well, I said it was a close-run thing. And in the end, Madison and Jefferson, their side won. Jefferson was in France, so Madison was running the show. Madison's side won. How did he won, win? He won by a fascinating coalition of Presbyterians and Baptists against members of the Church of England. The Church of England was the majority religion in Virginia. It had been established in a formal old-fashioned sense, in the sense that areas or parishes of Virginia were organized just like parishes in England were. And that meant that the government took its taxes and literally paid for the upkeep of the church and paid the salary of the minister. And in fact, I don't know how many of you have ever lived in or around Virginia, lots of towns in Virginia have things called Glebe Road, G-L-E-B-E -E Road. 
Glebe Road is like a common name you'll come across as you drive around Virginia. Not just in the obscure parts of Virginia, but in the DC suburbs. Um, and you'll never find in Massachusetts or in any of the New England states anything called Glebe Road. Um, and if you ever wondered, and I don't think I'm the only person who ever wondered about this, but one of a small number of people probably, um, why that is, it's not that there's a person named Glebe, although I, I think I thought that the first time I saw it. A Glebe is a name for one of the subdivisions of the English parish in which, through which the church would be funded. So because there was an established Anglican church in Virginia, you have these Glebes. In New England, where you did not have that system, for reasons we could talk about in the Q&A, but I'll leave aside for the moment, you don't have anything called that. Okay, small digression on uh, the nomenclature of Virginia streets. Um, but relevant. So the Church of England wanted very strongly to this proposal that Patrick Henry had in mind because they had been stripped of their state funding. And stripped of state funding, they were in deep trouble. Presbyterians were split. The Presbyterian clergy wanted the rule too because they thought that their, their own parishioners weren't that good about making donations. And they figured this way they would have to make the donation, they would get their, their salaries paid. Madison was outraged by this. He couldn't believe that these priests, or rather these ministers, these Presbyterian ministers were so perverse. But the Presbyterian laity strongly opposed the rule because they said, we don't want this money to mostly go to support the Church of England. We think that voluntarism is the right way to do it. We want to make voluntary contributions. And the Baptists both were small and also ideologically committed to government laying its hands, getting its hands off of religious funding. So through this coalition in Virginia, Madison had succeeded in blocking the law. And what he was saying to the ratifying convention was essentially, what happened here can happen on the national scale. When there are enough sects, in that case just three sects, the one that wants to dominate will not be able to dominate. Now I said to you a few, I'm gonna now update us to the present. What I said to you a few moments ago is that Madison was probably wrong about the capacity of the religious diversity in the world in which he lived actually to avoid domination. And I gave as an example, Catholicism. And I wasn't just being abstract. Because as Catholics began to immigrate to the United States in large numbers, a process that began, uh, as you know, uh, in the late 1830s and then really hit its stride in the 1840s with the Great Potato Famine in Ireland, which brought hundreds of thousands and then millions of Irish people, mostly Catholics, to the United States. As Catholics, especially ethnic Catholics, became a larger and larger presence in the United States, they faced extensive discrimination and extensive prejudice. And though it's a topic for a totally other lecture, how the ideology of that oppression functioned, I'll just say here for the moment that the fact that there were many different Protestant sects did not stop Protestants from creating, for example, de facto Protestant prayers and Bible reading in the public schools. And when Catholics raised their hands and said, well, we understand that you say the Lord's Prayer is everybody's prayer, but your version is different than ours, the response of Protestants was tough. And when Catholics said, well, we understand you think that the King James Version of the Bible is just a universal version of the Bible, but you know, it has an introduction, rarely reprinted today, that describes the Pope as that man of sin, and so we would prefer it not be read in the schools. Again, the positive reaction was tough. And when this went to a vote, the only places, and the only tiny number of them in the country, where you didn't have these kinds of Bible reading practices were places with lots of Catholics. In places with lots of Protestants, the Catholic arguments got nowhere. So again, this is some empirical proof that Madison was wrong. That said, let's now skip forward to the contemporary world, let's say the, the world of 10 or 15 or 20 years ago, in which the school vouchers movement was really getting, hitting its stride, and in which there was suddenly political support of a very complicated variety, supported by Catholics who didn't want to close Catholic schools that were losing students to the suburbs, advocates of better education for inner city populations where the public schools were not doing a good job, who wanted children to have the chance to attend Catholic schools, and evangelical Christians who were committed to the idea of allowing state funding of religious institutions. This coalition of people got together and were able to pass in several places in the United States voucher programs that, as I said earlier, were at least analogous to the Patrick Henry model of non-denominational funding, non-preferential funding of religion. Now, what happened then? Liberal advocates of the separation of church and state, and I count myself among them, raised our hands in the air and made an enormous fuss about how if the Supreme Court were to uphold voucher programs, it would be the end of the world. I and others said that the sky was falling. 
So what is the content of our argument? Or at least my argument. And my argument ran something like this. Regardless of whether it was a good or bad idea, for the previous uh, almost 200 years of American history, the government has never funded religious institutions in our country, especially educational institutions. There were some cases of the funding of Catholic hospitals, but only for the wholly secular component of the healing of people, not the religious part of those institutions. So this is our tradition. And people like me acknowledge there's a history of anti-Catholicism here, but we said, this is how we do it in our country. We don't fund uh, religious institutions. If you have voucher programs, the state is now directly funding religious institutions. Jewish schools, Catholic schools, Muslim schools, Buddhist schools, you name it. And we said, I said, in that environment, there is simply no reason not to expect there will be many, many people who will demand um, to send their children to religious schools and get state funding for it. So voucher programs will break out all over. And what we'll see repeated across the country is a deep politicization of school funding, and potentially the thing that Madison said he was worried about, namely the oppression of religious minorities who may in theory be entitled to start their own schools, but in fact may not have enough people to start their own schools, may not have enough funding to start their own schools, and the whole process, we argued, will be geared for the majority in the locale, which will set up the funding program, the voucher program, to serve their own interests. Do we have empirical support for this claim? Yeah, we had a little. Because in all the places where there were voucher programs, the amount of the voucher magically corresponded to the cost of sending a kid to a Catholic school. And it was cheaper to send your kids to Catholic schools than other schools, because one thing, the schools already existed. Uh, for another thing, many Catholic schools, this is decreasingly true today, but many Catholic schools had much lower cost per pupil of providing good education than other private schools, because they were able to draw on a class of teachers, priests and nuns, many of whom had sworn a vow of poverty. So if you're a school superintendent, your ideal employee is someone who has sworn a vow of poverty. I mean, some of them, people may say oh, that's what a public school teacher is. But I mean, a public school teacher is stuck with poverty, but has not sworn a vow to be poor, and presumably would prefer not to be poor. So you know, there were various built-in mechanisms. And sure enough, in places where voucher programs were put into existence, magically, as I said, the amount of money uh, tended to correspond almost precisely to the amount to send kids to a Catholic school. Not surprising, since usually between 95 and 98 percent of people using school vouchers were actually sending their children to Catholic schools. So this was the concern, this kind of uh, um, sky is falling view. And for those of you who looked at uh, my book, Divided by God, that Alan kindly mentioned, I, in the final chapter, after I did some historical analysis, I took a sky is falling position on this. And then I had some clever ways we could try to solve this problem. Um, the sky did not fall. The Supreme Court, it's now six years, the Supreme Court held that these programs are completely constitutional. They have not proliferated. They have not been taken up in too many places. Um, they have not been used any more than they were previously used to marginalize religious minorities. So one question is, the question with which I want to conclude, and I want to bring Madison back in here, is why? Why hasn't this happened? Why did this guy not fall? Well, it sure enough turns out, in my view, that the answer was staring in my and other people's faces, but I blame myself in particular for not noticing this since I actually, after all, I've just been writing about this, all along, namely that Madison was right about his structural argument. He was wrong about the America he lived in, but he was right about the structural argument that if you have enough religious diversity, in fact, no individual group will have the political capacity fully to dominate the other religious groups. In other words, diversity of interests actually discourages domination. Now, how did this play itself out with respect to religious schools? Well, there are people everywhere in the world, everywhere in the United States at least, rather, who would like to send their children to religious schools and use state dollars to do it. But they are forced to acknowledge that if the state can fund a Catholic school, the state can fund a Muslim school. And many of them are very unhappy about the possibility of funding a Muslim school. It will also have to fund a private secular school that's anti-religious, and many evangelicals would object to that as well. It turns out there's a kind of self-regulating mechanism built in to the problem of funding religious institutions, and it's a problem that derives from the fact of religious diversity. So let me be clear. I believe the overwhelming majority of evangelicals in the United States, if they live in a school district where they could guarantee that the funds that were gathered from the public would only be used to educate children in evangelical schools, would be thrilled to have those evangelical schools work. And I believe the same is true of many, though by no means all, Catholics. But such a district hardly exists in the United States. 
almost every place, there's at least the possibility of the organization of some school which would teach beliefs, the content of which the supporters of those other schools, of the Catholic or the evangelical schools, would find deeply offensive. And they say, I don't want my tax dollars to fund that kind of school. So the fact of religious diversity is standing as a structural barrier against their decision to pass laws that might have the effect of marginalizing or limiting the options of a religious minority. So the punchline here is, and this is why I wanted to call this talk Madison's Politics of Religion Revisited, the punchline here is that Madison, I think, was not quite right about the world in which he lived. It was religiously diverse, but not diverse enough to make out his argument. He was, however, I think, right about his structural claim in a broader sense. And it took 200 years for us to find an actual real-world instance, because it took people breaking down the norms as they had existed of the separation of church and state. But once that happened, the thing that, remember, Madison predicted in his letter to Jefferson, where he said, if people want to, they'll just break down these norms. And in fact, he was right. People did pass these laws, and the Supreme Court did flip its views. The Supreme Court of these guys had repeatedly held that this would be unconstitutional, and the Supreme Court just flipped its views. And yet, the structure of diversity managed to uphold religious liberty, has managed to do so overwhelmingly, where the Constitution as a parchment barrier failed, and where the political will, um, one would think, would itself have inf had infringed on that liberty. Thank you very much for listening so patiently, and I'm eager to hear your comments and questions.